All right, how's everybody doing? Summer at Spring Hills. Good, good. I'm Brett, um, pastor here at the church, and yeah, looking forward to getting to know you. I want to encourage you to come tonight for the citywide worship night. It's going to be off the hook. I'm just telling you, just get that. The whole staff has this feeling like you know, there's a lot of momentum. We can sense it. Uh, there'll be five different pastors up here, and uh, they're going to share for five minutes each. And then the worship team is a combined team with like amazing. Uh, Amazing time, and uh, 5.30 it starts with the service, just so you know, okay? Not doing dinner first, service first. Are you with me? Okay, good. Uh, we are going to start a new series uh, today on Romans chapter 8, okay? Romans chapter 8 in the Bible. If you think about the Bible as being a, a mountain range with peaks of truth, you know, like grandeur and all throughout from Genesis to Revelation, when you get to Romans chapter 8, this is the Mount Everest of God's truth. It really is. It's, it's a chapter that just brings together such profound and wonderful things from God, truth from God. So we're going to spend six weeks on this chapter, and today I'm going to give you just one verse. Okay? One verse. Some of you say, amen, pastor. That sounds good to me. All right. <laughs> and it's, I love this verse of scripture. Uh, it's probably one that I, you know, when you th have to, when you think of a scripture, uh, this one comes to my mind all the time. Uh, and it's this. Here it is. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've got good news for you today. If you are in Christ Jesus, and I'll explain what that is, there's no condemnation for you. No, not a none, not at all uh, in Christ. Now, the reason why this is so encouraging to me is because I'm one of those who quickly condemn myself when I don't measure up. Am I talking to anybody in here today? I mean, I, I have a personality. I'm a, I'm a feeling personality. I have an intuitive uh, personality. What that means, intuitors are able to see what they could be, you know? Like what the possibilities are. And I know what I, I could be. And then I know but I, what I am, you know? And I feel about that. And so I can be, I can be immobilized and obsessed with guilt sometimes. And it's like, what's going to pull me out of this? Some of you are like this. You, you're, you're, you're so self-critical. And, and it goes not just from, you know, critiquing yourself, but it goes right down to condemning yourself. And one of the tools of the devil is to condemn you. You know, the devil, devil has a number of, of uh, tricks in his bag. For the church, he's always trying to divide the church. That's what he does. Divide it, divide it, divide it. And individually, it's always about condemnation. It's always about you can't serve because of what you've done. And, and what are you doing worshiping me when look at you, you're inconsistent and all of that. And uh, people mentally can just like and emotionally get to a place of breakdown because the weight of not measuring up. You know, you throw in, not just spiritually, but you throw in the, culturals, the cultural stuff, like you're supposed to be married by now, or you're supposed to have 2.2 kids by now, and you're supposed to be this in your career by now, and, and look at you, you're not, you're not doing anything right, and nobody knows, let's not let them know, and you carry all this stuff. Burdens, burdens, weights, uh, way down. This verse of Scripture right here is your answer to all of that. This verse right here is your answer to mental health, everybody, uh, and spiritual health. If you can grasp this verse, and, and it's short enough where we could all memorize it, right? If you grasp this verse, it's going to free you, and God wants you to be free. So let's walk through it, all right? Verse by, or phrase by phrase, word by word. There is what? Therefore, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Therefore. Therefore indicates that he's been arguing something. He's been setting forth his case, and now he's concluding this, right? So we want to know what's gone on before that has led him to this conclusion. And when you read the book of Romans from chapter 1 up to this point, what you discover is his, the Apostle Paul's argument uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant lawyer, if you will, setting forth a case. 
And the case starts out this way. We're all sinners, everybody. None of us measures up. That's how the case begins. And whether you're religious or not, whether you're Greek or Jew, male or female, it doesn't matter. We've all fallen short of God's glory, all right? So we're in this, that together. We're all sinners. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're all sinners. That's good news. All right. We're all messed up. Some of you deny that, and all we got to do is check with your spouse, and they'll confirm it to us. I am messed. So we're all sinners. You know, we have, the, we have the law of God. The Jewish people had the law of God. This is Romans chapter 2. They had the law. They had the commandments, the promises. The problem was they didn't keep the law. So having the law doesn't make you right before God. Keeping it does, and nobody keeps it. Now, some people grow up and they're not, you know, they're not religious and not, they don't Jewish heritage. They're Greek, if you will, non-religious. But you know what they have? They have the law of conscience. Ah, this is in Romans chapter 2. Your conscience, uh, it bears witness, right? For guilt, falling short. It's like God's put his laws, not just on Ten Commandments, but he's put his laws in the heart of man. And man knows he falls short. Feels guilty. Unless you're a sociopath, you know, and you have no guilt. Scary thing. No conscience. That's what a sociopath is. God's put his laws in your heart, and so we've all sinned. And there's no hope. That's how the book of Romans goes. There's no hope of working it out ourselves, of fixing it ourselves, of delivering ourselves, of making things right ourselves. We need something outside of us. The problem is not education, you know, more education. The problem is not more money. You know, it's certainly not more politics. It's, the problem is within. It's not environmental. If you want to know the, the heart of the problem, it's the human heart. That's the, where it's at. We are all fallen in our hearts. So we need something outside of ourselves. God in his love has sent his son, Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, to deal with this huge problem, which is our own sin. And outside of us, God sent his son and Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin so that you could stand holy and righteous and accepted and blameless before God through what Jesus Christ did for you when it's credited to your account and your, your debt of sin is paid in full. That's the book of Romans as he's arguing it. Uh, he argues in many different ways. Here's a good summary of it in verses 23 and 24 of Romans 3. Okay, here it is. This is another good passage to memorize. For how many have sinned all and fall short of the glory of God and are justified or another declared righteous, forgiven, if you will, justified before God and are justified How? How are we justified? By His grace as a gift. Not justified through what you do, church attendance, helping the poor, trying to be a good moral person. That doesn't justify anybody before God. It makes you look good before your neighbors and your friends. Okay, that will grant you that. But doesn't give you right standing with God. You're justified by grace. That's God giving us what we don't deserve. It's a gift. Oh, receive the gift today. Some of you have a hard time receiving gifts, don't you? You know, somebody tries to take you out to lunch, and you say, no, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. And they say, no, I want to pay for it. And you say, no, I'll pay for it. You pay for it last. I want to pay for it. <laughs> I want to give you a gift. And at the end, let me pay the tip. No, you don't have to pay the tip. Let me pay half the tip. Well, you just receive, you know. <laughs> just receive a gift. Now, there was a payment. Somebody did pay. It's a gift of God through what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He paid it. His blood paid it. His shed blood, his death. That's what the cross is all about. That's a payment for sin, not his. Jesus was perfect, but ours. Peter says in his first letter, Peter says, we weren't redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold. That's not what redeemed us, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of the spotless lamb of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, was acceptable to God the Father on your behalf for the forgiveness of sins, His blood. Isn't that good news? 
If anyone is in Christ, Jesus, therefore, he is forgiven no condemnation. This is the key phrase, right? Got to be in Christ. But notice, there's no condemnation when? Now. Okay? There's therefore now. It doesn't say uh, maybe tomorrow. See how God's feeling about you. You know, you have a better day tomorrow. You had a bad day. Tomorrow there's maybe no condemnation through Christ. Or in the future sometime, you know, in the future uh, when things turn around and things get a little bit. There is therefore now, right now, where you sit, in Christ, no condemnation for you. He paid the penalty of your sin. You're free right now, right now. Embrace it, take it. It's your position before God through Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. It's your, it's your life. It's the way you live now before God with no condemnation. And notice, he emphasizes it. There is therefore now how much condemnation? None. No. Nada. Nair. Is that German? What is it? Wait, wait, wait. Anyway, no condemnation, all right? It doesn't say there's therefore now some condemnation for some of you because you really are bad. You know? And uh, there's therefore now a little condemnation for some people and a lot more for other people. There's therefore now no. No. Not some. Not, not conditioned on something. Now. No. Right now. Okay, so no is uh, a Greek word. Udes in the Greek, all right? Say that, udes. Comes from two words, u, which means not, and ace, which means one. This is a very, this word here, no, in the Greek, there's a, there's a number of ways to present it. This is a very emphatic, uh, emphatic word. And actually, in the literal Greek, there, it is in the emphatic position. In the literal Greek, it is there, now, is no, therefore condemnation. You know what I mean? It puts it in the beginning of the sentence. If we translated it literally, it wouldn't be smooth enough for us. But it's put in the emphatic position. No, not one. That's the Greek word. Ooh, no, not, and days, day, or none. There's no, not one, or one. There's nothing. Not a little bit. Nothing. Put on the breastplate of righteousness in Christ, the Scripture says, but which you can withstand the attacks of the devil. You know what the devil does is accuse you, you know. You put on the breastplate of righteousness, and when he attacks, you're firmly secure. And the breastplate is who? Christ himself. Christ finished work on the cross. Take up the shield of faith, the Scripture says. Put it in front of you so when the devil fires his darts at you, Darts of doubt, darts of discouragement, darts of depression because you're not measuring up. The shield of faith. Faith in what? The righteousness I have in and through Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation. Ah, it's good news. Now, this is a very important phrase, okay? Who's that for? Who's that for? For those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? That's the big question. Are you in Christ? I don't know. What does that mean? To be in Christ. Let me illustrate it for you. This is awesome right here. I just want you to acknowledge that. <laughs> I don't always do this kind of stuff, but when I do, it's always really good. Okay. Who is this? Yeah, you, right? It's you individual. And uh, the Scripture says, therefore, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And inside this is a nature that is bent on sinning. I mean, this is a fallen you, enslaved to sin and ultimate death, separation from God, the Scripture says, under the wrath of God. Condemned apart from Jesus Christ, but this is you. When you come to faith in Christ and you apply to yourself the finished work of Christ on the cross, when you apply it, when you believe and trust in it, His precious blood forgives you, washes you, makes you right with God. And the Scripture says Jesus comes to live where? Within you. Makes you a new creation. And you are placed positionally where? In Him. 
in him. In Christ. That's that theological phrase. So that now everything that's true of Jesus is now true of you because you're in him. Isn't that good news? Bible says in Romans chapter 6, you were buried with Christ. You were buried with Christ. When he died for sins, you died with, you died, your sins died with him, your old self. When Christ was raised from the dead, you were raised with Christ. You're in him. Ephesians chapter 2, you were seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're in Christ. Let me ask you a question. Is there any condemnation that can come on Jesus Christ? Anybody condemn Jesus Christ? I mean, perfect. The Son of God who lived a perfect life. There's no condemnation. No one can condemn him. Can anybody condemn you? No. They can. They can. But they can't because you're in him. You see, when God looks at you, who does he see? He sees his son. You're not condemned because Jesus Christ is your shelter, your protection, your strong tower. You All that Jesus Christ is has been credited to your account. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 is an amazing chapter of the Bible. I encourage you to read that too. It says that God chose you before the foundation of the, of the world to be holy and blameless. You know? Holy and blameless. And you're like, huh, I'm not holy and blameless. Right? I mean, I, yeah, I'm not holy and I'm not blameless. I've got stuff in my life, my past. I got just this week driving to church. Why does it always happen? Big fight on the way to church. You know? Uh, I'm not holy and blameless. God chose you before the foundation that, of the world that you should be holy and blameless in Christ. Declared, adopted by God in Christ. You see, this is who you are. This is your identity when you come to Jesus. And that's why there's no condemnation. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? This is later on in chapter 8. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies in Christ. Who's the one to condemn? And then he goes on, nothing will separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You see, you can't be condemned because Jesus was already condemned and you're safe in him. You're safe and secure in him. This is the, this is the peace of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and have gained access into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Let me give you that again. Chapter 5 now, a couple of chapters before 8. Therefore, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and have gained access, access to God in this grace, through this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And hope doesn't disappoint because the Holy Spirit's been shed abroad in our hearts. And I'll talk to you about that next week. The power of the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts. Are you in Christ? That's the big question. If you're in Christ, you're protected. If you're not, you're not protected. I want to read a passage from the Gospel of John uh, where such great news, but also I want you to think about this because it's also very sobering news. John 3.16 is a famous verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Were there ever sweeter words spoken by the Lord than that? God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his son for you so you wouldn't perish. You wouldn't die in your sins, but you could have eternal life if you but trust in him, believe in him. But the verse goes on. Listen to this. Whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Here, here's a scary thing. You come to Jesus Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. To reject Jesus means you stand on your own before a holy God. And no one's going to be able to stand before a holy God without the advocate Jesus, without the, without the finished work of Christ. You can't stand on your own. And I, I exhort you, I implore you, I urge you with everything in me, come to Christ. Let him be your defense attorney. L let him be the one that when God looks at you, sees the work of his son on your behalf. And you, you go into heaven totally based on him. 
Now, why wouldn't people come to Jesus Christ? I mean, it still baffles me. You know, I'm a pastor. This is such good news, isn't it, everybody? God loves you. Jesus died. It's like, it doesn't get any better. Why would people not? I mean, Sonoma County just come in. Well, part of it is they haven't heard, right? So that's what the church is about. We're trying to, like, build bridges so people might hear. But Jesus goes on in the same context. Listen to what he says. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. Jesus, the light of the world. And people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Jesus came in the light of the world, but people like their darkness. Verse 20, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. There are some people that say, I, I'll take my darkness over the light of Jesus Christ. I'll take my sin, my secret life, my whole thing. I'll take that. I like it. I like it. I don't want to come to Jesus. As a matter of fact, I hate that. And that's scary. You know, I mean, I don't know. Is it fear? You know, is sin really that great? I mean, really, is it? I, mean, I look around. I don't think it doesn't seem that great to me. Why not come out of it? Why well, believe the devil's a lie? Come out of that to the light of life, Jesus Christ. Yeah, confess your sins. Confess your need. Let, it, let him shine the light of his presence on it all for healing. For healing. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Now, this in Christ phrase is like amazing. Uh, listen to this verse in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, listen, in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Do you know, because you're in Him and He's in you, you have right now every spiritual blessing there is to have. You have it in Him. You're a joint heir with Christ. You're seated with Christ. You will rule with Christ. Every spiritual blessing, forgiveness, God's power, God's presence, holiness, being in a condition of being blameless. What spiritual blessing do you want? What do you want? You have it in Christ. We just need to learn this more and more. We, and we just need to get the truth of God's Word, you know, in our hearts and minds and live it out. Every spiritual blessing, you don't need anything. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You have all the love you need. You have all the acceptance you need. You have all the power you need. You have all the assurance you need. You have all the security you need, all the safety you need, all because you're in Christ, protected by him. And we just need to discover this. Not only that, he says that it's what unifies us. The scripture says what, what makes us a church. Romans 12, 5, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. You know what the church is? This is what the church isn't people who just come to church. That's the crowd. That's not the church. Uh, the church is made up of all those who are in Christ. That's what he says. We are one body one body, how? In Christ and individually members of one another. When you come to Christ you're, you, you, as your Savior, you're placed in Christ and you're also placed in his body called the church. It's how we have unity together, Christ in you, Christ in me, the Spirit of God bonding us together. And can't you feel it? Can't you feel his presence among us? We love each other. We care about each other. We're so different, but we all know him and he knows us. That's the church. And then it says this, and this is an amazing passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, another therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, you become a new creation. Why? God comes to dwell within you, the person of the Holy Spirit, and makes you alive, opens your eyes, and clears your head. So you can see and changes your will, changes your nature from a fallen sinful nature to a new nature being fashioned like Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created how? In Christ for good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. It's all like new now that Jesus is in me. 
and Jesus is in you. Come to Christ. You want your life to be different? I know some people come to church. I want it to be different. Here's the answer. You need to know Jesus Christ personally. You need to have him regenerate you, and you need to be born again and made alive in him and know him and grow in him and know the truths that are in Scripture. That'll change your life. That'll change your life. A few good moral tips on how to be a better this or better that isn't going to get it, everybody. It has to be a new creation. You need to be buried with Christ and raised with Christ and seated with Christ and him in you. So it kind of kind of leads to this point, I think. How do I get placed in Christ? I mean, how am I to be put in Christ? And I'm going to give you three things, all right? First of all, confess your sins to God. You know, the Apostle Paul said it in his argument, we're all sinners, we all fall short. Agree with that, okay? Confess in the Latin, con means with, right? Fest means to speak. So speak the same thing about your sin that God does. That's what it is to confess. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Agree with God. Don't make excuses. Don't say, well, you know, the family I grew up in, I'm a dysfunctional person. Okay. I've got a disease. I've got a problem. I, you know, you're, you're, we all sin. We sin. Let's, let's call it what it is. Before God, what is it? What is it? Before a whole, it's sin. We just agree with him. The scripture says this, you are guilty before God. You're guilty before God. Here's the evidence against you. You don't keep the law. You don't measure up to it in the spirit of it. You're guilty. This is what you say to God. You say, I'm pleading guilty on all accounts. Right? Right? And then your advocate, your defense attorney, Jesus, walks in and says, I'll defend them. I paid the penalty of that sin, and he's in me, and I'm in him. So he goes free at the expense of what I paid on the cross for him. But you don't say, I'm, I'm innocent, and I'll prove it. Then what are you doing? You're rejecting what God says about you. You're rejecting your need for Jesus Christ. You just plead guilty on all accounts and let the Lord save you by his grace. And that's what it is then to put your faith in what? Christ alone. That's it. Christ alone. And why do we say Christ alone? Because sometimes people put the, their faith and reliance in Christ and themselves. And they live like that. Like, I'm going to be good and I'm going to, you know, show up and I'm going to do what I was supposed to do and I'm going to trust myself. And yeah, Jesus did his thing and together we're going to get saved. No, 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 no. Wrong. I mean, you just, you just are bankrupt before Jesus Christ. And you're putting your trust in Him alone. Have you done that? Scripture says when we do that, God's forgiveness, mercy, and grace. And it leads to a position where we don't boast, you know? I mean, there's no boasting around here, right? We've talked about this. Nobody boasts about anything other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what we boast about. Um, so you come and you put your faith in him, and then you receive the gift of salvation. Say, this just sounds too good to be true. Is there any fine print here? I mean, is there any, like, you know, the stuff you didn't read and find out that it's different than what you thought? And all I can tell you is no. <laughs> the only thing it will require of you is some humility, though. As one writer said, we love religion, but we resist humility. I mean, the only thing it requires of you to be placed in Christ is that you, you, you acknowledge your total need for him and you confess your total inability of yourself. Now, you know how human beings are and how human beings, our pride gets in the way. Like, we'll solve it, you know? We're talking about going to, the Mar oh, going to Mars now. Just one step after Mars and we'll solve it. You know, more education, more money, more, you know, I, human pride, I'll solve it. Or, nah, I can't believe all that stuff, you know. People used to believe that, but I don't, I don't believe all that stuff. What is that? It's just arrogance, right? God's saying to you, look, will you come to me? 
And listen, I'm believing right now the Holy Spirit is calling some people to himself. And that, the scripture says that it takes that. It takes the Holy Spirit touching your heart and pulling you to God. And if you feel the Holy Spirit, maybe for some of you it's like the light goes on and you go, I get it, now I get it. And the Holy Spirit is drawing you to himself, then come, just come. Be, be saved today. Find yourself in Christ, a whole new life. And have that assurance. And if you're a Christian, the devil pounces on you as a Christian and says you're a hypocrite and you're not doing it right and you haven't done it right in your past. The devil comes and you just tell him this. You say, you're right. I'm not going to argue with you. You're right. But I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. And what Christ accomplished on the cross has been accredited to me. I'm holy in him. You can't touch me. Yell as you will. Accuse as you will. My faith is in Christ alone. Lord, thank you for the cross and this wonderful promise that anyone who's in Christ, there's no condemnation. God, we rejoice in that. We praise you. We receive it. We trust it. We believe it. You, the eternal Son of God, did that for us. And if you're here today and you're just like ready to come to Christ because the Spirit of God is working in your life right now and drawing you and opening your eyes to see this, then just say to the Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm not going to argue with you. Oh, forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me with the precious blood, your precious blood spilled out for me. Cleanse me, wash me. I want to be in you. I want you to come into me and make me a new creation. Place me in the body of Christ. Seat me in heavenly places. Give me every spiritual blessing that is in you. And Lord, help us as a church to share this good, great, awesome news with friends, family, and our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.